There will be spoilers ahead. Lots of spoilers, so be careful, won't you? All right, I'm not picking this up, number one. Can you adjust your mic? Yeah, yeah, we need more gain, number two. All I'm getting is bush. Yeah, less bush, more voice. You know what I mean? Right. Okay, okay. I think we're getting some good, clear sound on Laverne. Or, or is it Shirley? Wait, wait, wait. What, what did she say? Is she... Is she singing? Oh, dear gods. Is that the Divinals? Holy crap. This, this is great stuff, number three. Step it up. No, no. I do not need clown. I need Shirley. Okay. Bring it close, team. This is it. She's going to spill the beans. Careful. Distance. Distance. Wait, wait, wait. What did she say? Turn up the gain, number two. I don't care if you need to aim that thing out of your ass. We have got to get her saying, Welcome to Max Mike Movies. <laughs> We're talking conspiracy in this series. This week, it's a lesser known Francis Ford Coppola film, The Conversation. Listening in on a mic stuffed down a parakeet is Max Deep Listen Levine. What's the secret password, Max? Uh, uh, uh. All right, right I confess, I killed him and dumped his body off the train outside of Cairo. I just uh, wanted sorry, to what know what question? you wanted for lunch. <laughs> ah, tur turkey salad, please. Turkey salad, yeah, that's a thing. And <laughs> I am a Mike of a different type. Mike, listen to this, loose. We got a lot to talk about with this film, but first, we want to talk about you. Poll question. Last week, we asked what star of the silver screen, living or dead, would you most want to sit down and converse with? Get it? Converse? <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe because of that. We only got a few answers, but they were good ones. Adam Mark gives us, quote, Betty Davis, a laugh riot, and I want to ask her all about her groundbreaking contractual disputes with the big studios. What was uh, it like? And if yeah. she's ghost Betty Davis, what does she think of the industry today? End quote. <laughs> yeah, we can't, uh, we can't print that in this show. Uh, Yikes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, pretty sure. I'm pretty sure that language would get us demonetized. What a dump. Uh, <laughs> she is a biggie. I can't imagine mm. the things she'd say, but thank you, Adam. Hmm. Val Coons, who, uh, yeah, right, no more relative jokes. Val yeah. said, quote, Madeline Kahn. I would love to ask her about oh. how she did comedy so beautifully. Blake Edwards is another one, now that I know how extensive his body of work is. He's become a bit of a writer hero to me. I'd love to learn his trick for putting humor in an otherwise serious genre so seamlessly. For an actual talk, Rian Johnson, just about mysteries and ways to fool the audience where they love being fooled. He has a knack I haven't seen in a long, long time, end quote. All very cool answers. Thank you. Yeah. Lastly, get ready for it. Wait yeah. for it. Wait for yeah. it. Yeah. Dave. Dave. <laughs> Answered with, quote, I would have said Zelensky, but the question seems limited to movies, not TV. And might need an interpreter. Trouble is, can't think of anything particular to ask these people. Wait a minute, Zelensky as in the president of the Ukraine? He's a voiceover artist. <laughs> oh, yeah. okay, sure, why not? Conversation huh. works best from ongoing friendship. I'd like to be friends with Jimmy Kimmel or David Letterman and hang out, but only if we enjoyed each other's company. There was a time when I could have been happy for, oh boy, Sawaguchi Yasuko's phone number, but I actually got the chance to talk to her once and she totally ignored me and ran away <laughs> with some handsome male model before I got oh. to ask for her number. I still think she's what fabulous, a, end quote. What a jerk. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Dave. <clears throat> and up yours, Sawaguchi Yasuko. <laughs> yeah, you'll never know what you missed. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, uh, thanks for answering this week's yes, poll question. Yes, thank you. Uh, this was a special one, as anyone who posted an answer in time wins a charter membership in the Bumpy Club Hut of Values. It's a Ooh, very exclusive club. Very, right now, there exclusive. are three members. Yep. Exclusive! <laughs> but what about you, Max? Who would you like to sit down with over a cup of tuna and a plate of crullers and speak with? Oddly enough, I think it would actually be awful, but people talked about this. I would love to have talked to Alfred Hitchcock. Ooh. I mean, let's face it, yes, apparently he was a huge jerk, but he always told you exactly what he thought. Hmm. He, he was, he was total. I, I would love to hear, because he was kind of an outsider who was still very successful. I would have liked to talk to him, or I would have loved to talk to Charlie Chaplin. Hmm. Just, what a life that guy had. And also, I admit, I kind of would like to lean over and slap him across the face for marrying a 14-year-old. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, that would you know be much more in, in style later with Jerry Lee Lewis and Hello. Jerry Seinfeld. And, and you know. wait, what is it with Jerry's? I don't, I don't know. What's the deal with Jerry's? Oh, oh um, what about you? What about well, you? Well, what, would you well, what would you ask them? Anything oh. in particular? Because that was part of your question. Uh, mostly, I'd want with the chaplain. I would want to hear just all about. That was the ground building. That was the beginning of Hollywood. Mm. I'd want to know, what was it like to work with Max Sennett? Do you, what did he actually think of Buster Keaton and all the people who some people say were imitating him or just other of the silent film stars? Yeah. Uh, was, you know, what, what was Douglas Fairbanks like? In bed. Oops. Yeah, okay, I don't know. But <laughs> I'd like to hear about, I would love to just hear stories about the beginning of Hollywood and the things they had to do to get movies done so unbelievably quickly. Hmm. Cool. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, when you say they were building Hollywood, I mean, you're right. They were literally hammering, putting together yep, Hollywood seriously, while they filmed there, those There was things. nothing there, yeah. Hitchcock, yeah. I, I don't know, I would want to ask him, why are you what such did a he dick? <laughs> well, no, I'd say what did he care that he never got an Oscar? Did he care that he didn't get the kind of professional recognition that I quite honestly he deserved from his peers? You mean like Spielberg? Oops. Ooh. <clears throat> well, he got one or two. So Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And his well, no, they didn't. Um he never got Best Picture, did he? Oh yeah, he did. Uh, yeah, Schindler's, Schindler's List. list. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh but he didn't get director, right? That was the big snub. I can't remember, honestly. Yeah. Mm. Um, me, uh, so all the, the the big problem is that with these big name creative people, you get tongue tied. You don't know what you're going to want to say. I picked two people, and I was it was kind of random, and both of their names again with A, so it maybe isn't that random. <laughs> okay. but I picked two actors that I both like that are not big names, never have big names, probably have done lots of films here and there, and they've been in films that I've really liked. The first one was Austin Pendleton. Oh, okay. He, uh, Interesting he's in choice. My, yeah, he's in my Co favorite movie of all of time, which course. is What's Up, Doc? Um, <laughs> he plays uh, Mr. Larrabee, the head of a some sort of musicology foundation, and he's granting money to uh, Ryan O'Neill. And he's he also, I think, showed up in the first Muppet movie. I think yes, he, was he the did. He was, of, he was uh, Doc, Doc Hopper's Hopper. stooge. Yep. Yeah, but he shows up in things, and yeah. he's a character actor. And I just get the impression that he's a nice guy, but he's probably seen as many of the things that uh, these other actors have seen. But I think I could actually approach him. Uh. Um, the other actor whom I really like and I don't think honestly got used nearly enough is Alan Ruck. Um, oh yes, okay, Cameron. Uh, I really like Alan Ruck. He's best known for playing Cameron in um, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Yep. Um, he was also in a Star Trek movie. He was in Young Guns right. 2. He was in Electric Speed. Boogaloo. Yeah, yep. he's in a lot of stuff. <laughs> he and is. again, I bet he's seen a lot of things. And again, he seems like somebody you might be able to sit down and actually just talk to. So, yeah, weird choices. But, uh, you know, Alan Ruck and Austin Pendleton. Cool. Yeah. This week... We're asking, because we have a new mm -hmm. question, or do we have a new question? Yeah, no, we have a new question. We have a new question, but we can't reveal it because no, we're they'd going to come after you. <laughs> no one's coming after anybody they except are. Bumpy to get you to sign up for the <laughs> Bumpy Hut. No, no, the Bumpy <laughs> Club Hut of Values mm -hmm. Club. Uh, anyway, what we'd like to know this week is what movie conspiracy, real or fake, just drives you right up the wall? Mm. In other words, you see a movie about this and it's just instant anger. Um, or instant, oh, come on. You know, a little grunkle stand, if you will. Oh, come oh, on! come on! <laughs> Let us know in the usual ways and maybe, just maybe, we'll open up that secret membership again. No promises. But now, on to trivia about The Conversation. Facts. Budget. Take a guess, Max. Well, let's see. Gene Hackman couldn't have been cheap. They had some pretty big names. I'm going to say uh, $6 million. One point six. Oh, wow. So the, this is actually, I didn't have this in the trivia, but now that I recall it, there were three directors as part of something called the Directors Corporation, which is the, the shows up in the beginning of this film, and it was Coppola, huh. and it was, um, oh, the guy who directed What's Up, Doc, um, 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 um. Bogdanovich, oh, okay. and I forget who the third one was, and the deal was, we can make any movie we want as long as it costs less than two million bucks. And without giving too much away, I think Coppola got his money's worth in this film. The take, 4.4 4 million. Mm. Uh, 
Those were the days. Yeah. That's a success. Yeah, it's a su- <laughs> it is. But that's not even enough. Like, well, no, it was enough to make a couple of sequels to Deep House. Because um, <laughs> remember, that's a film that only cost a million dollars. Of all his movies, this is Coppola's favorite. Really? Did not see that coming. Didn't either. Not The Godfather. Mm-hmm. Not uh, not D- Francis Ford Coppola's Dracula. <laughs> yeah. I, I, no. No. <laughs> If you haven't seen okay. that, don't. Yeah. <laughs> it's also apparently Gene Hackman's favorite performance of his own. I could kind of, I could see that. This is it, but we'll get to that. It is a very un-Hackman. Yeah. Um, by the way, that is indeed Gene Hackman playing the sax. He learned it in a book. Yeah, that's right. He, I heard about that. He learned it for this movie. Yep. <laughs> Wow. Uh, this movie was written well ahead of his better known film, The Godfather, but until that movie became the most successful movie of its time, he couldn't get this one financed. Uh, actually, it goes back to 1966 is when he had the idea for this movie. Boy. Yeah, that's a very, very young Harrison Ford playing a <laughs> gay character. Good. Is he? That's what he says. And that green suit he's wearing? Yeah, that was Ford's idea. Both of those things were Ford's idea. Um, huh. My guess is. Harrison Ford doesn't know many gay people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not saying he did it badly. I just wouldn't have known if that didn't pop no, up. No, I, w- I didn't know until you just told me. Well, I think the one clue we get is he says, uh, Christmas cookies, I made them. You want some? That's it. That's as close as we can guess that the character's gay. Because oh. only gay men make Christmas they, cookies. Oh, oh uh, okay. Yeah. In relation to the first movie in this series, Enemy of the State, it's been theorized that the character Hackman plays in that film, Brill, is actually the same character here, Harry Call. As we mentioned in that episode, photos of a younger Brill are actually ones from this film of Harry Call. Coincidence? Conspiracy more like it! (laughs) I don't know what kind of conspiracy. A dull one, I guess. Probably. Believe what you will... The fact that the same electronics depicted in this film were the ones used by Nixon during his tenure is, according to Coppola, purely coincidental. Really? Mm. Even though Nixon's mentioned in a newscast during the movie. Yeah, and I wasn't going to put this in there, but do you realize who's doing the newscast? I do not. I do not. It is, in fact, Francis Ford Coppola. (laughs) Oh, okay. (laughs) Now, to be fair, this movie was written in the 60s and released a few months before Nixon would resign. And yet... Uh, And yet... mm, Nepotism of the (laughs) highest order! The roles of the confessional priest and a security guard were played by none other than a certain Richard Hackman. Aha! Conspiracy! (laughs) Hey, at at least Francis didn't put any of his his family in this movie. Uh, yeah, and the funny thing is, is I think the priest we only see through a screen, and the security guard we only see from behind. So yeah, yeah, and I don't think <laughs> yeah. the priest has any lines. Uh, this is a Coppolaism, and thankfully it was something that was, um, shall we say, um, changed. The original cut of this movie was over four hours long. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, that that tracks. <laughs> yeah, snubbed. Though Hackman won the Golden Globe, BAFTA, New York Critics Award, National Board Review, and Sant Jordi Award, whatever that is, he mm-hmm. did not win the Oscar for Best Actor. Mm. Conspiracy! Was uh, he nominated? Yes. Okay. Max? Yeah? Make me stop saying, conspiracy! No, I don't oh. think I will. <laughs> <laughs> Cheating! <laughs> the central voice recording used and interpreted in this film was actually two recordings, with one done to specifically emphasize different parts of what's heard. Con- I wondered. Yeah, I wondered about that. There, there's yeah, there's certain words that are stressed when he's listening yeah. at the end. It's like, okay, he did not say it that way. Yeah, not in the well, first time. Yeah. Could, oh. <laughs> Couple of I, received- okay, I've changed my mind. I will stop you. <laughs> Coppola received numerous awards for Best Director for this film, but not an Oscar. And why? Uh, Well, because he'd win it for Godfather 2, that's why. (laughs) Yeah. Which is probably the reason that this film is not as well known. It came out the same year as Godfather (laughs) 2. Oops. A little bit overshadowed. Yeah. Yeah. It's a film that some people think is even better than Godfather 1, which a lot of people consider is one of the best, if not the best, American films of the 20th century. I think there's a reasonable argument to be made for that. So I can see why you might have said, you know, I'll see one Coppola film this week. That, that's, <laughs> that's enough. <clears throat> Kyle MacLachlan starred in a produced but not bought pilot for the Conversation TV series. What which would they, that have been like? I think they just retitled it Twin Peaks. Huh? Diane, I'm holding in my hand a small box of chocolate bunnies. 
Uh, okay. He does use that. a tape recorder. Aha! <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and so much more, but we have to get to our conversation. Mm. But, but first, but first, the plot. Mm. Unless you, do you have any other trivia about this film? Well, just in, just in terms of someone who shows up in it, in the the, it, it, the uncredited person. No, no, the meme. Oh, yeah, we'll get to that. Okay, <laughs> it's one of my first notes. <laughs> That's what I hate right. memes. Anyway, yes, go, <laughs> as you go should on with the plot. Yes, the plot. Harry Call, not Edward Lyle, or Brill, played by Gene Hackman, is in the surveillance biz. He's been contracted to tape a certain conversation out in the open between two people for reasons unknown. This is a big operation with a van, three separate people running mics ranging from shotgun to one hidden in a shopping bag. Harry oversees it. With three separate tracks, Harry is able to mix the entire conversation clearly onto one tape for his mysterious client, the director who is not uh, Francis Ford Coppola. Oh. When he goes to deliver the tape, he's met by the director's assistant, played by Harrison Ford. This wasn't the original deal. Harry was supposed to hand it over in person. Affronted, Harry takes his tapes and walks until the original contractual details have been met. Meanwhile, something about the conversation, seemingly innocuous, is starting to haunt Harry, making him paranoid past his already rather paranoid state. When his lover, Terry Gar, starts to ask seemingly innocent questions just to get to know him better, Harry cuts her off. The next day, at a convention for the surveillance biz, I'll repeat that, at a convention for the surveillance biz, Harry meets up with some others who not only know his work, they respect it. Perhaps too much. Realizing that he has no real social contacts, he invites him back to his workplace, only to find out that there's something more going on. One, Moran, ostensibly Harry's equal, wants to partner with him and find out his secrets. Harry closes up more, even when one of the women invited to the party stays and has sex with him. Thing is, all is not what it seems, and when he wakes, the tapes are gone. It comes out that a big case Harry was involved in while living in New York resulted in the murder of an entire family. It's this guilt which causes Harry to withdraw, partially as what he hears in the tape sounds like it's evidence being gathered to perhaps trigger another murder. Will Harry's guilt force him to get involved way, way over his head? Or will his paranoia send him running in the other direction? And who listens to the listeners? Only Francis Harrison Ford Coppola knows for sure. <laughs> The film. So, Max, uh, yeah. you're a, a, a Coppola fan of sorts. I know you, yep. you love oh, both, yeah. both of the Godfather films. Yes, the only two Godfather films. I like both of the Godfather films that exist. <laughs> Conspiracy. <laughs> when was the first time you saw this film? Oh, boy. I saw this film back in the 90s, I think. So still even 20-some-odd years after it was made. Yeah. Yeah. I had never heard of it. Yeah. I, before that, I didn't know what it was. I'm like, wait, wait, this is a Coppola movie? Seriously? Yeah. Okay. Um, sure. Yeah. Uh, do you remember your reaction at the time? Yeah, mostly I walked out of there going, I hate this. <laughs> I <laughs> hate this so much. Did I'm make- going. I'm going to go home and pull all the wallboard down and look for microphones <laughs> everywhere. Yeah, this we'll was get- the worst movie I could <laughs> a per- that I could see. <laughs> Because this is saying, hey, you know all those little paranoid impulses you have? They're right. So what you're saying is, this film said to you, whatever you do, don't get into the IT security business. Yes, pretty much. And then and you went got and got into, into the, the IT security. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm very stupid. I hate myself. I do, I do, I do. <laughs> yes, no, so, th- yeah. yeah, so my first real note is, in fact... A mime! Shoot him! <laughs> My first note is actually, hello, Shoyle. <laughs> well, so we have... Cindy Williams is in this. And Harrison Ford, who, of course, had yeah. just been with um, George Lucas in American Graffiti. So, mm-hmm. yeah. And Terry and Gar. Terry Gar is in this. And who's always, she's always Robert in friggin' Duvall, uncredited, is in a couple of scenes. Yeah. Um, and there is a twist in this film i know we're getting ahead of ourselves yeah. i'd like to kind of shy away from that because okay. i don't think a All lot right. of people have seen this film i and don't th- i think you're right i don't I think this is not very well known and luckily there's most of the film does not involve this yeah. twist yeah. and so we can talk about a lot of that and not give that part away 
Um, but yeah, so with a lot of names in here that seem at first you're like, well, why are they here? And then it's like, yeah. everybody works out just yeah. fine. E- including, yes, the meme. <laughs> who is, did Did you know who that was? I actually it, recognized it, him by the haircut. Please tell me it wasn't Shields. Please tell me it, it wasn't Shields. It was Robert Shields. Oh. Of the, the, and I use the term loosely, famous <laughs> mime team of Shields and Yarnell. Yeah. Who were was. a big thing in the 70s. For a minute. Yeah. They had they had their own variety hour. Max, you and I had our own variety hour. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure. I don't remember it real well, but I bet we did. Yeah. It's just after we had done doing our variety variety hour, we didn't have any more and friends. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. Because you know Max's tap dancing is well, he's been better. I'm just. <sighs> Yeah, mimes. I just I, that's the thing. As soon as that's not shields, please tell me it's not shields. I was hoping you wouldn't tell me it was shields, but yep, yeah, shields yep, and you're now that's right up there with um, Donnie and Marie, Sh- Sonny and Cher, the yeah. Brady Bunch. Everybody. They were sort of the the black mold of the '70s. You couldn't escape it. It just got well, in places. I think it's, we could make an argument for the fact that shields and you're now directly led to Pink Lady and Jeff. Oh. <laughs> I don't know if you could draw a straight line, but I bet there might be a conspiracy involving it. Yeah, yeah probably. Oh, Lord. Um, did, sorry. Did you see? This is way off. In the late 70s, possibly, maybe it was into the 80s, there was a remake of Wild Wild West. What with do you mean? The Robert, one with Will Smith? No, no. With Robert Conrad and uh, who was it who played Artemis Gordon? Oh, yeah, I know who you mean. I can see yeah. his face and I can't think of his name. Can't remember his name. They did a TV movie. They actually did a couple of them. Did they? And that were like 10 years at least after the show, maybe more. And Shields and Yarnell show up in the first one. <laughs> yes, they do. Sure. Because nothing as, says Wild Wild West more than a couple of mimes. <laughs> well, oh, no. These are 19th century cyborgs. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, uh, and okay. uh, they were built by Dr. Loveless's grandson, played by Paul Williams. <laughs> Who yes. is not technically a little person. He is person, not a little person, yet. he is just kind of short. <laughs> but who else know. says the 70s more than Paul Williams? Serious. <laughs> Shields and Yarnell, that's who. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, right, this is getting Shields away from this. The other thing that, really, that got me, uh, and... I didn't rec- I didn't put the name together right away. Is John Cazale is in this, and wh- he's in the van. That's Stan yep. in the van. <laughs> and I'm going. Oh, good lord! It's Fredo. Right. Yes, it say, is. He, that he is Fredo from Godfather. the Godfather. Yep. Yeah, he does. A, he he gets off a little better in this film than he does oh, in the Godfather. Yeah. Well, he ends up better, but you know, uh, John Cazale, yo. Know, May the gods love him. Uh, he's he's great. He doesn't have a whole lot of he doesn't have a lot of arrows in his quiver. He's kind uh, of playing a less whiny version of Fredo in this. I I didn't get that impression. Fredo, mm. from what I remember from The Godfather, was very ineffectual. Yeah, and that was his big problem in a in a family full of heavy hitters. He couldn't even really throw the ball. Yeah, and he was expected to, and he kind of failed. And then, of course, he sells out the. Oh well, we're yeah. giving things away here. So entire yeah. episode yeah. on the Godfather. Yeah, um, just interesting here, to see. Yeah, I think he actually shows that he's very competent, and he's got a pretty reasonable complaint, and that is that Harry, our main character, won't tell anybody anything. Yeah, um, Harry and we spend is very most of the movie. Off. Mm-hmm. Not knowing why Harry is so paranoid, why he's so distant, and why he's so off-putting with people, even when they're co-workers and he doesn't want to talk about work. You know, it's like, this doesn't concern you, and finally Stan's had enough and goes to work yeah. for this guy, Moran, who is the East Coast version of Harry, except much more of a jerk. He's um, also, he, I, he, I don't think he is the East Coast version of Harry. He wants to be the yeah. East Coast version. He may be even kind of thinks of himself that way except he comes across once when harry won't work with him and you see the frustration and the insecurity he knows he's never going to be as good as harry yeah he's a more of an operator he's much more of a businessman than harry is but he's not as good yeah and he won't show up in enemy of the state either um yeah i want to stick with the acting if we can right now uh Mm. harrison ford surprisingly uh effective and surprisingly menacing he is kind of creepy in this and yeah. kind of intimidating and not even, at all even over the Ford. phone no 
it really does not play that sort of likable rascal that he's best known for. Yeah. yeah he does, he uh. does a very nice job. Terry Gar surprised me, because I'm like, they made Terry Gar look kind of frumpy in this. I suppose. Um, although, let's face it, it's the 70s, the early 70s, and as you well know, bright colors were outlawed. Oh, that's um, true. <laughs> <laughs> they won't show up till disco. Yeah, um, yeah. It is a very subdued, what's the word, chromatically subdued film. Yeah. Uh, and that was a thing at the time, and I honestly think it's sort of a blowback because color really wasn't... You didn't always expect color till probably the 60s, because even in the 50s, half the films coming out, mostly B-movies, were still in black and white. Yeah. And we weren't going to get really widespread color in TV till the late 60s. Star Trek was one of the biggest deals because it was all color, and that was 66 to 69. In living so I think, color. Yeah, in living color. And NBC, and yeah, they were too. But I think, and because I, when I first saw The French Connection, it was a film that's made around the same time. I was like, wow, did they just bleach all the color out of this? And I think that that was just the thing. It was a it was, style. Well, I think it was part of that cinema verite thing that was going on yeah. from the French. Yeah. But it was also just like, we need to, enough with the color. Let's just show, re, let's see gritty. Let's see more real life. And this film, there's really almost no color in it. You know, um, it, mm-hmm. Cindy, and, Wilmy, uh, Cindy so, Williams, surprisingly effective. Yeah, she has about 12 lines, but she does a nice job. But she doesn't come off as that ditzy Sherl character, which is the only thing I've ever seen her do besides this. Um, Other characters in here, I don't know the actors' names, but there's not a weak performance in the bunch, I don't think. No. But if you've seen Gene Hackman before, you're probably going to go, that's Gene Hackman. Not that he doesn't look like him. But he's not the Gene Hackman we're used to seeing. Gene Hackman tends to play very in control characters, very, you know, intense, tough, calm. Sometimes, sometimes you get you get the angry Gene Hackman. I mean, I know it's silly, but one of my favorite roles of his is still as Lex Luthor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, he has still done the best Lex Luthor I've ever seen on screen. It just, Mr. Doesn't it, just the, doesn't it just give you a little thrill to be in the same room as me? <laughs> <laughs> and that great line that he delivers perfectly, even with the timing, it's just like, there's a strong streak of good in you, Superman, but then nobody's perfect. Yeah. Almost nobody. <laughs> I, mean, I love I'd that. Say- if anything, with Gene Hackman's performance in general, the word that I would say best expresses them are confidence. He's yeah. very confident. And here... Harry is a mess. He, he is, is very messy. Inter- one of the things, this was, again, a thing of the times now, but I, I was watching this going, you know, if you saw Harry today, I would wonder if he were somewhere on the autism spectrum. Yeah, I could because see that. Because he doesn't make eye contact. He ha- he's not good at reading social cues. He's ve- he's got obsessive behavior. He's got he ticks a lot of boxes. Mm. I, and the thing is is that and I think this is something that's a, a credit to Coppola, not that he really needs any, especially yeah. at this point in his career. But there's this sort of central unanswered question about Harry that exists through most of the film. And because of that, that's what keeps us interested. Because otherwise, Harry's not your average protagonist. He's not an anti-hero. No. He's, we're not really sure what he is. He's doing stuff that's not very nice. And he's, he's not terribly likable. Well, and that the thing is, is that we get the impression that it's on purpose. Because mm. when, we, when he lets his guard down, when he starts to let his guard down, first with Terry Garr, and then she just starts asking him questions quite reasonably since he's been seeing her for a long time. She wants to know where he works. A perfectly normal average why, question. Why has she never seen his apartment? Where right. was he? Where was where is he from? Is he married? Mm. Um, and she's it's his birthday. How people know this, I never could yeah. figure. Who sent him the wine? He gets I, wine. We don't know. Yeah. And the first thing we and it's inside his apartment. The the building manager yeah. has left it inside his apartment and, and he Harry doesn't calls like up, that at all. Well, he calls up and tries to be as thankful as possible, but it really quickly gets down to how the hell did you get into my apartment which has yeah, four and locks and alarm and don't system? Don't ever do it again. Well, yeah, and he's like I'm going to switch my mail to a PO box yep, starting because tomorrow. she's opened his she opened the card. Yeah. Well, but who sent the wine? We, we have no idea. Honestly, the card looked embossed. I bet it was a former client. 
Yeah, but how would they... I'd, Harry seems to me in this point in his life, for reasons that we may get into, not to want to tell anybody what his address is. He keeps claiming through the film he doesn't have a telephone. He lies. Yeah. Um, he does he never gives anyone. He never gives anyone the number. He's always... No. Whenever it rings, he freaks out. Right, because it shouldn't. No, oh, yeah. he should live in today's world. Ooh. Oh, boy. <laughs> Of course, these days for me, mostly if the phone rings, it's always, who the hell is that? <laughs> <laughs> um, but his performance, Gene Hackman's performance, is exceedingly layered and exceedingly nuanced, and he draws us in. We want to know, why is this guy like this? And thankfully, it's not something they, they leave unanswered. Maybe. Um, we don't know, though. We know that We know this terrible event happened. What was he like before it? We don't know. Was he different? We assume. But again, there's a lot of work on the part of the audience. We have to decide yeah. that that's, that's what happened. We do not know. And we also don't know what drove him into this line of work in the first place. Because he's a surveillance guy. That's what he yeah. does. He bugs people. He's a people. bugger. Mm -hmm. And the big story, and this is not the twist, but the big story is that his last job in New York was a very big job. It involved some sort of labor... labor yep, labor thing. unions, who and are, by the way, always involved with very nice legal people <laughs> who don't do anything bad. Max, there's almost nobody listening to our mm. show. I don't think you have anything to worry about. They're, <laughs> list, they're all listening. Oh, I wish that was true. Mm. Um, hey, listener. Uh, <laughs> maybe we'll make the Christmas party at the NSA this year. Ooh, I said NSA. <laughs> Um, oh, great. You triggered the Echelon program. Thanks. Well, I will once this is edited and printed yeah, or whatever. Yeah. Anyway. You think um, they're not listening now? Uh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> I hope they're enjoying the show. They at least get to hear all the flubs that I edit out. Um, so he has, was part of this bugging, and apparently the job itself was legendary. How? I don't know. How do you become a famous spy? I don't know, but it I, Yeah, happened. it's kind of the James Bond thing. It's like, hello, yeah. I'm world-famous spy James Bond. Oh, but blam! But apparently these labor organizers only ever talked on a boat, and it was out in the middle of nowhere. They wouldn't let anybody near, and this is the part that I think is interesting and unstated, and I'm going to make a guess here. This guy, Moran, who wants to be Harry and wants to yeah. work with him, is saying, basically, I want to know how you did this job. I know for a fact that boat was bug-proof. My feeling is they'd hired Moran, and Harry beat him, and that somehow somebody found out. Makes sense. But but the deal and they is they blame one of the guys on the boat and the guy on the boat gets his family gets tortured and killed and he yes. gets tortured and killed and that's what we're pretty and then sure ha then Harry leaves Harry New York for the west yeah. coast yeah yeah although initially when this opens i thought we were in new york i didn't nothing about this film says san francisco until way yeah. late in the film yeah i mean at one point it's like oh there's a california license plate 3 quarters of the way into the movie okay yeah, we never see, you know, rice a um, <laughs> No still I, cable cars, yeah. Like, I didn't know that San Francisco, like New York, had at one point been infested with mimes, you know, but yeah. apparently that wasn't. <laughs> oh, wasn't I, I was pretty sure they have all kinds of street performers <laughs> in San Francisco. They, they breed in the sewers. Uh, <laughs> yep, yeah, yeah. then they started spraying Malathion on the city to get rid of the mimes, yeah. Sure, but... Um, Basically, Harry ran for the West Coast and more or less an enemy, an an, 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 that word. And, <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, and son of a son of a son of a, son of a, son of a, <laughs> son of a gun. Yeah. Oh, yeah, look that one up on YouTube. Yeah. yeah. Um, and now he's still like the best at what he does, and what he does isn't very nice, snicked. But <laughs> somehow he's still known for it. And there is. Very interestingly, a surveillance convention. Which That's real, by the way. I, I checked that. They I have like, those things. If, if you're going to attend this, whose name do you use? <laughs> yeah. But he's, uh, he's not just well-known. He's a celebrity. There are people who want to just hand him their merchandise for free just to be able to say he uses it. Yeah. Everyone he's introduced to goes, oh, wow, you're Harry Call? Yeah. 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 Um, just he's a rock star. Yeah, which is again, how do you get to be well, whatever? Uh, yeah, it, it's fine. It's I think that's the one small leap you have to make in this film because that's a really about it. Otherwise, great performance by him. Uh, great performance by Robert Duvall. I think he's got two lines. Yeah, um, he's in like two scenes, and he, he Robert Duvall's the hell out of it. Well, and we talked about this in Enemy of the State because he does the same damn thing. He shows up for five seconds and he just blows the screen away because yeah. it's Robert Duvall. Yeah. And 
even when he glowers, there's actually a scene where he's just sitting there with his Doberman, and I'm like, oh, this isn't going to go over well. Yeah, you're, um, he's sitting there with a Doberman, and you're going, the Doberman is the least intimidating thing <laughs> in this scene. Yeah, and I don't know if it was actually his dog, but that dog was, if it wasn't Duvall's dog, it was really well trained, because it's just looking at him like, what are you going to do now? What are you going to do now? What are you going to do? <laughs> and he leaves the room, the dog's like, I'm coming too. Um, yep. Yeah. Yep. So... And there's there's some other uh, character or actors in here whose names, to be fair, I don't know because they they're not familiar to me. But you know, Coppola picks good people, no matter what. Yep. No matter what. <laughs> Coppola's Dracula. He picks yeah. good people. <laughs> um, also, just so you know, because I know you were really wondering about this, Harry has a nice stereo. Trust me oh, on this. Oh, okay. That is a really nice setup. I'll, I'll um, have to take your word for it. I don't know that stuff. Yeah, this is when Harry is playing his saxophone. He's got some jazz in the record player, and he plays along. Um, I, if I were his neighbors, I'd kill him. But, you know. <laughs> yeah. As, as it turns out, one of the things, and I left this out of trivia, one of the things cut out of the film is there's a whole subplot where we find out Harry actually owns the building. Oh. Which hmm. changes things. That changes right? a lot. And Not well, to mention the fact that it makes that last scene when I'm thinking, <laughs> well, there goes your security deposit. <laughs> yeah. So let's just say that uh, without giving anything away, uh, this this is one of those those clients that never actually gets um, their stuff and leaves. Um, there's the very uh, distinct threat that Harry, regardless if he ever works for them again and probably mm-hmm. won't, is going to be watched. Yeah. And they play a bit of Harry having just played the saxophone to this record back to him over the phone that nobody's supposed to know about. And Harry spends the last scene of the film literally ripping every part of the apartment apart. Tears up the floorboards, tears down the walls. It's a a profoundly unsettling and uncomfortable scene. Now, I do have a talking question for you. I'm not going to do all of them now, but I do have a talking question for this because the very last shot of of the film is Harry sitting there playing a saxophone. Yeah. Does Harry actually find the bug? I don't think so. I why don't, don't be- you think so? I'm just—I'm not saying right or wrong. Just why don't you think so? Be- well, first of all, he's overlooking the fact that it could simply have been someone across the street with a shotgun, Mike. Okay. Second of all, they know this guy. They know who he is. They know what he's capable of there, and they're going to find some way that he can't find it. Well, and the implication, of course, is that Harry's the best. So yeah. who do they find? The only thing that pops to my mind is Moran. Well, Moran, maybe. Yeah. And maybe Stan helped out. We don't know. Yeah, we don't know. And I do love me a little bit of ambiguity in the endings. Yeah. Um, and this one's not... A lot of people hate ambiguous endings. I know, Max, you don't like them particularly. I'm, it depends. I didn't mind this one. But yeah, I, 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 like, I, I like things neat. I can't help it. This one, it's the story that we're looking at ends, but Harry's character can be guessed at and played with. And to me, that makes for a strong film. When you sit there and wonder about the people after the film, not why yeah. would they do anything so stupid, but like what happens to them next? You know, what does this mean for them? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. That to me means you've made probably a pretty decent film. Yeah, or um, at least created a really interesting character. Although we don't know, because we haven't decided yet whether we like this film or not. Right, right. Um, One of the recurring themes with Coppola, and I'm sure you've noticed this, seems to be Catholicism. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, Harry is a devout uh, Catholic. He does not like people taking the Lord's name in vain. He goes goes to church, if not that regularly, because doesn't he say it's like it's been... Four six months. months was it yes. some number of months since his last yeah. confection confession confection <laughs> confection sure i haven't had a donut in uh, weeks <laughs> forgive me father i <laughs> yes forgive me pillsbury doughboy i <laughs> i'm browning <laughs> <laughs> but, and yet there's that little bit where he's tearing his apartment apart and he's smashing all of his knickknacks and he's putting them in a bag and the one he does not want to touch is what I assume is plastic, because yep. I don't understand, because he took it apart, is a little Virgin Mary statue. Yeah, it's some sort of thick vinyl, because it's, it's, yeah. it's rubberized. Um, so that's strange. Like, that's really funny, is like, oh, I can't wreck Mary, even though she probably cost me 39 cents. Yeah, but he you know. eventually goes, yep, gotta know, I gotta know. Yep. And you see, that's, that's what drives him, more than his Catholicism, anything else, he has to know. If there's a bug, he has to find it. Well, and to me, that's one of those little detail shots 
that could mean huge things. That could represent his loss of faith. Yeah, he finally has just given it. The world has taken too much from him, or he's just like, nope, this the world is horrible. There, I don't, I don't believe anymore. My feeling. I know I asked you this and I didn't answer it. My feeling the first time I watched the film during which I had COVID, so I didn't actually, which was only like a month ago or two months ago, yeah. and I actually forgot most of the film. <laughs> so here's a tip, audience. Don't watch a film when you have a fever. Um, not if you want to remember it. Yeah, not if you want to pay attention, yeah. My feeling was that he does find the bug. The reason okay. that I think he does is because he's playing the saxophone and he seems relaxed the first time since he gets since he got that phone call that he seems relaxed. Hmm. What does that mean? Don't know. But he hasn't run out of the apartment. He hasn't, mo- you know. Of course, we don't know that it's his building because they cut that part out. Yeah. But um, I, I think he does. But I think he's hmm. going to be playing a game for the rest of his life, n- always assuming that there's somebody listening because there may or may not be. Okay, I think that's a reasonable uh, interpretation. And I like that it's up to us. We get to choose. Um, and I, again, I, when done well, I think that makes for a really strong ending. Um, there's a couple of things that I do kind of question. Going back to the beginning of the film, we see the, the couple walking through. We hear music. And then we start hearing this sort of distorted sound. And we realize, oh, there's shotgun mics and there's people doing yeah. surveillance. And we see Harry. And when the couple walks by Harry, he gets up and goes to his surveillance van which happens to be parked right next to a cop. <laughs> it's yeah. like, why is there a cop here? This seems, and the cop does not well, notice when he goes into the van. So One I, of the guys working for Harry is a cop. He may have had a word with the guy. Uh, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, and ironically, the one guy that they make, that they spot following them, the couple does, is the cop. Yeah. Which is fine, and, and you know, that's also very believable. A lot of surveil, a lot of cops moonlight. They they need uh, additional income, and a lot of them work for private security, or I guess in this case, surve- a surve- private surveillance uh, operative. Sure. Um, stylistically, this is a film that you would not make this way now, and by this Probably way, not. I mean Coppola lets the camera linger. And there's some shots early in the film where Harry goes back to his apartment and we're literally looking at a radiator. Like, that's yeah. it. Mm-hmm. Harry's walking back and forth and we're listening to things going on. and why, But it's it's this emptiness. There's a lot of stillness in this movie. There's a lot of not of uh, uh, static shots. Yeah. Not a lot, and not we're given time to explore. Yeah. And what do we see about Harry? We're st- you know, when you're given the same thing to look at for a bit of time. I don't know about you, but my mind starts to wander a bit and I start to go, well, what's going on with this? And I'm seeing this for one of the things that was hanging in this particular shot besides the radiator and a doorway is a painting. And it's not a very interesting painting. And I started thinking about the painting and I was like, I bet it came with the apartment. Yeah. I bet he didn't even pick it. And what is that for? That tells us more about the character. And we hear one of the things he's saying to his, I guess it's the superintendent. Must be. Um, is he's like, I don't care if anybody breaks into my apartment. I don't have anything personal here. Yeah, because she's, she's obviously saying, you know, I need. she needs to be able to get in. What if there's a fire and you lose all your possessions? And he's saying, I don't have anything to lose. Yeah. I, it's more important to me that nobody can get into my apartment. Yeah. So it's a sprinkling of details like that. Okay, and this is another one that I was in trivia and I left out. So originally Harry Call's name was supposed to be C A L L. Get it? And there was a misspelling when they did the script and they misspelled ah. it C A U L. Yeah. Which is a membranous covering of a newborn or a pre newborn baby. Notice what he's wearing throughout the film. He is wearing uh, this see-through raincoat. Uh, there is a thin layer between Harry and everything. A being born, a child being born with a call is very, very rare. I mean, keeping right. the call when they come out, and it has. There's a lot of superstition around it. It's yeah. mentioned in the opening of David Copperfield. He's born with a call, and they auction it off because someone believes it. Pro- it will protect you from drowning at sea. Ah. Yeah. Well, you know, I can kind of see it because you were inside liquid up until that. (laughs) Now it's a stretch. Yeah. Um, But apparently that was once Coppola saw this and decided to keep the name that spelling. There are a number of times besides that raincoat where there is a thin membranous 
something between the audience and Harry. Yeah. In his yeah, office true. during the office party, he goes behind this this, this plastic place. curtain. Yep, yeah, and the shower curtain in the uh, hotel room. And, and for me, that's the touch of a really thoughtful director. Um, when you're adding little things in that that don't mean anything to most people, but those who are sitting there paying attention, it makes things more interesting. Um, the other thing you couldn't do today besides lingering shots, because we, we can't deal with that anymore, is the film's pacing. There's almost no action in this film. Very, very little. And I don't know about you, did not have a problem with it at all. The nope. film just Keep, moves along. Moves along. Keep, the tension level is still very high. Yeah. You're absolutely riveted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what's going to happen. And I don't know what has happened, right? Because we don't know what happened with Harry. So it's not, it is certainly not boy meets girl. It's not boy loses girl. It's not boy gets girl again. It's not one of those stories. This is mm. not a story that we generally see much nope. of. Very unconventional. And the character development, some of it has already taken place. And it's almost like a geometrical theorem where it's like, given this, now what? And that's kind of what we're doing. or Well, I should say what Coppola was doing because all I did was watch it. <laughs> yeah, it's a very odd narrative in that it doesn't feel like this is what you're... Traditionally, this isn't what you would focus on. The The story, we you would think traditionally, would be what's going on with Cindy Williams and Robert Duvall and the guy with the glasses and yeah. Harrison Ford. They, they're they supposed to be the main narrative, not the guy who's on the outside listening in, literally. Right. And yet, that's the focus, and it's that's what we want to know about. And we get that to some extent, um, because it's this is the central part of the, the plot, right? Is that, what, oh, yo, he's recording this, and it's supposed to be uh, for this client, and you know it's supposed to be a thing and what we we all figure is going on is that Cindy Williams is married to somebody the director in this case and she's cheating on him yeah and what um what does that you know is is this going to become a thing is it going to be more or less of than what it seems who is the director we don't know um, yeah we assume i mean Traditionally, you would go, oh, okay, he's getting evidence for a divorce case. or He's doing, let's face it, this is what private investigators do a lot of. They do a lot of, is my spouse cheating on me cases. Yeah, and this is obviously fairly high profile because this guy doesn't even have a name, the director. Yeah. But he is also, he's got people between him and... Uh, Harry. So Harry's trying to get to see him, and there's Harrison Ford's in the way, um, which is actually enough to keep me from wanting to get any closer. Yeah, yeah. At least in this film, um, the guy with the glasses reminded me kind of of um, one of Martin Short's characters. <laughs> oh, oh, the sleazy lawyer. I know yeah. that. It's so funny. You think I don't know that? <laughs> yeah, and I can't remember the character's name. I don't know he, if he had a name. No, he, he did. did. He had some name like it was. Pretty much Sleezo or something. No, it, it was an actual yeah, name, but yeah. it was the funny part was that he's very sweaty and and this guy is very defensive and kind yeah. of moist. And he's he's <laughs> the one that's that's cheating with with uh, Cindy mm -hmm. Williams. Yeah, I want to get to if we can our little uh, talking points about this yeah. series. Sure. So in this film, what is the conspiracy? That's actually the hard part. Uh, we the conspiracy turns out to be something the audience doesn't think it is. Well, I think it could also be that the conspiracy is that people are listening in potentially all the time. Oh, all those people in the 70s have no idea. No <laughs> clue. No <laughs> clue. I mean, at this point, it's, and we've talked about this earlier in this series, but it, it's basically like, hold up your phone and just say, I pledge to let the CIA find out anything yeah. they want. You, yeah, you already have. You did that when you clicked on, I accept the terms and conditions. Yeah. Uh, pretty much. Uh, the thing is, the conspiracy in this is in some ways much more menacing because it's much smaller scale. This is not the government or right. the NSA or the Illuminati yeah. or Dan Brown. It's... <laughs> You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dan Brown, or the author Catholic, of many a Hardy Boys novel, yeah, uh, yeah. Or, or the or the Catholic Church, or any of that. It's 
these guys, and it's maybe this one company. Yeah, it's it's much more intimate, and as such, it's much more it's much more feels much more personally menacing. Even though we don't see it, yeah, mostly. we have no idea what. Yeah, it's guesswork on our part, guesswork on Harry's part, and when the violence come, and I will say that the violence does come. To today's standards, it's nothing. Yeah. But there is one shot in particular that involves a toilet that I was just oh, really boy. creeped out by. The first time, I, I mean, I knew what was coming, but this time, but the first time I saw it, I was like, <laughs> Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's not I mean, grotesque or anything, but it's well, very disturbing. It's amazing how much you can say with how little, yeah. I think. Yeah, it's very um, understated and very well done. And the thing is about a good conspiracy story is, and I think that this film does this, is when you start asking a question like, well, what if this? And then you realize, well, what if that? Well, what if, wait a minute, what about that? And I think that at the end of this film, we start asking those questions. It's like, wait, we think so and so is involved. What if this person's, what if that person How was big involved? does this, who do you work for, man? Yeah. Um, the, the next of our talking points is, do we believe the conspiracy as depicted? I think so. I think the audience definitely would. It's very convincing. I say so. The only one that I'm like, really? Is that gadget Moran has where he can put this thing in your phone, dial it remotely. Before he dials the last number, he blows a harmonica into his phone. That says something. And then he dials the last number and your phone doesn't ring, but it activates the microphone. That's real. Oh, good. I'm glad to know. <laughs> Not anymore. During the days of analog telephones, yeah. tone generators could activate certain kinds of hardware because literally it was the, it would send the tones. Huh, interesting. That was one of the most famous hackers or phone hackers of the 70s or 80s was a Captain guy called Crunch. himself Captain Crunch. You know why he was called that? I, uh, it was the whistle. It was a yep. whistle. He in. got a whistle ring out of a box at Cabin Crunch, which he discovered was exactly 2,600 hertz. Oh, which that's was the 2,600 magazine. That's where it comes from. And that was the exact uh, frequency needed into a belt, a bell payphone to override the pay mechanism. Wow. Cool. So, yeah, sound had a lot of power back then. Nowadays, I'm not saying they can't do this. By the way, there is malware out there that can turn your, if you download it or if it gets sent to you somehow, can turn your cell phone into an, a complete surveillance device. Uh, so they, you heard it here fo uh, first, kids. Don't click on anything. Yeah. <laughs> ever. <laughs> ever. Anything. Yeah, nothing. Yeah, I, I, there was nothing unbelievable about what was nope. going on in this film. It's nope. like we're using spy tech. And as I pointed out in trivia, turns out that Nixon thought it was pretty cool because that's what he used. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. So uh, I think it's uh, a oh, it's very conspiracy believ very believably believable. depicted. Yep. I'm pretty much to the end of my mm -hmm. notes. I just like that there's a couple of lines in there I really liked when Moran is trying to be jovial. and He's talking about reading Dear Abby. And he said, yeah, the letter, it was signed lonely and anonymous. That's Harry. Yeah. It's like, okay, you're a jackass. You're not wrong, but you're a jackass. Yeah. Well, and then he does something really stupid. Oof. And yep. he, he, hand, he at the convention, he gives Harry a pen like you do. Like that was a thing yeah. he did. I, I, of course, I'm just like, don't trust the pen, Harry. Too late. The, yeah. uh, the pen was a whatever. Like, you know, Monty yeah. Python, Monty Python. <laughs> and he ends up recording a conversation that Harry has alone with one of the women. Yeah, Meredith. Invited. Yeah to the party yeah and then plays it back for him and it's like you're trying to get this guy to work with you and you just wow. did the thing he hates the most you listened in on him you eavesdropped and of course harry gets really pissed off but even then he doesn't lose his stuff he just gets really angry and just shuts it all down yeah gets everyone out well yeah. most of everyone he out. doesn't scream he doesn't you know because he doesn't do that yeah yeah, but I think the other thing too is that Harry is not depicted as good as he is. He's not perfect. Yeah, and there's a moment very soon after that where Harry is very much not perfect. Nope, I did not see coming, and he didn't see coming. And in the morning, it's like, oh crap. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. The only other thing, Max, is have you ever uh, subscribed to Security World magazine? <laughs> uh, I have not. 
Ah, pity. <laughs> Security World magazine. Security do you give world. your right address, and if you don't, yeah. where do you get it? <laughs> oh, no. It's simply taped to the underside of a mailbox <laughs> in, in whatever near the major government building in your town, and you have to know exactly what time to go and pick it up. Yeah, really high delivery costs on that oh, one. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, save up for Security World yeah. magazine. But, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty much what I've got. Well, let's go to the uh, that thing that used to be called the Roundup. Yep. The finish. To Max. Yes. You saw this in the 90s. I did. You remembered being coming out feeling even more paranoid than you thought you were going to be when you went into the film. What do you mean by that? <laughs> yes. Oh, Max. Yes. <laughs> I'm tossing up the chum and you're coming to the surface. <laughs> Where the customer is our chum. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that was, have you only seen it once till yeah. you watched it for the show? Yep, because I didn't want to see it again. Oh, well, you should have said something. No, this is a, it's a, an excellent uh, example of this uh, genre of the conspiracy theory movie. Is the, it? What do you yeah. think now? <laughs> now it's even worse. Honestly, <laughs> sure, the tech is 50 years out of date. So what? The whole idea, absolutely believable. And the character of Harry, absolutely, you know, I'm, there are guys like him out there now, only now they're, well, now they're the guy from Enemy of the State. They're in a Faraday cage surrounded by computers, Yeah. Uh, you know, who, who, never, you, who have 5,000 email accounts, none of which are in their own name. Yeah. I actually, they couldn't obviously just decide that that character and this character are the same one. For no. one thing, there's no sense that Harry in this film was ever working for the NSA. It, also, Harry to, would be about about 100 years old. Well, except it's the same actor. No, that's right. It's actually, actually, no, there's 99, it'd be about 20 years old. No, that could have worked. He could have yeah. been. Yeah, because, what is it? We know how old he is. Uh He's oh, free. Well, it depends. Well, it depends if you're on the phone yeah. or you're looking at the card, because right. he lies about his age. Yeah, he's either 42 or 44, and yeah. two movies are 20 years apart, and Hackman looked like, yeah, no, that could have yeah. worked. Um, I think it's actually a really cool use of the character Enemy of the State that way, because there either is history for this character or there isn't, and it still works either way. Yeah, the only thing is, I think in Enemy of the State, Gene Hackman's character is more likable. And uh, has better social skills. Max, you're only saying that because he has a cat. Exactly. That is <laughs> that is irrefutable evidence. He has a cat. Meow, meow, evidence, meow. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> you're so, just so, buying into big dog. I, no, I, I'm a cat person. <laughs> yeah. um, so you like the film? I do. I like it. Well... I don't enjoy the film, but I think it's really well done. It's not something I would want to sit back and relax and watch because there's nothing relaxing about it. But I think it is a superb example. Of, uh, I think it's a really well-made movie. I think it's a great example of Coppola. Yeah. I just, that big mistake. It's like, ah, I'll put them both out the same year. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> if they, like, if they watch one, they'll watch the other. Oh, Frankie. Dude. <laughs> yourself seriously <laughs> come on it's gonna be 10 more years before apocalypse now give yourself some slack yeah really and especially in that case whew, mm. there is a film i don't know if i ever want to do for this show but uh, oh, yeah. that it that that film is work yeah uh i'm gonna agree uh, the first time i saw this film i was sick with covid uh it's again about two months ago and for some reason i kept wanting to re-watch enemy of the state which is what led to this series and I finally did, yeah. and then I was looking for, you know, if you like that, you'll like this. And I'm like, what's this conversation? What the heck is that? And I looked at a Coppola film, really? And I'm like, oh, well, you know, I'm sick. I'll give it a chance. <laughs> yeah. And I watched it, and I made the instinct. It's like, this is the same character? Blah, 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 blah. I think it's an excellent film. Um, yeah. I'm not as paranoid as Max, probably, maybe. I don't think so. No. Um, That's just so what you, you want me to think. <laughs> it's what I want me to think. Wait. That, huh? No. I, yeah. <laughs> um, either that or I just don't care. People want to listen to me doing the goofy stuff. It's not entirely like, I'm sure there's a tape somewhere like the ones that they make of Pat Oswalt. <laughs> <laughs> um, where I'm doing funny voices yeah. or singing in the car. If you really want that, fine. I don't care. Um Sure, there's probably stuff I don't want you to have, but there's not anything uh, I can do about it. Oh, you sweet summer child. Anyway, yeah. yes, go on. <laughs> um, 
I was very surprised by this film because I knew nothing about it and didn't expect it to be as good as it was. Um, the conspiracy really is, you know, who, the whole who's watching the Watchmen thing. This is, in some cases, they watch themselves because one of the big parts of this film, guilt, which ties into that Catholic thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Is Harry finally actually taking a look at what he does for a living and realizing that, hey, you know, there's consequences to this, you know? Oh, I, I, you know, I just gave him tapes. I didn't yeah, have anything to do with it. that's what he says. No, no, I don't do anything. I have nothing to do with it. I'm just doing my job. I just listen. It's like, yeah, yeah, there's cause and effect. Sorry, buddy. Yeah. I didn't kill those people. No. But what you gave the people who did them gave them the you, reason to do it. <laughs> you set events in motion. Yeah. What's the word I want? Complicit. I yeah. think that you are complicit with yeah. this, Harry. Um, there's some great acting by by Gene Hackman. Apparently, mm. this was so opposite his personality and his usual type that he was a little hard to get along with on the set. Uh. But everybody remained friends afterwards. They all knew it was just because this was not him. And he was he. You can feel it. He is itchy in his own skin. The yeah. few moments he, very he relaxes, mm -hmm. he's not really relaxed. No, no. Um, it's, it's, it's amazingly action free and still amazingly interesting. Yeah. And moves I, along. It is just over, no, just short of two hours. Yep. I looked up the first time I looked up, it was over half over and I'm like, really? Yeah. Wow. And this was the second time I watched it. So I kind of knew what was coming again. Fever. Mm. It doesn't help you remember a film too well, but yeah, I would say if you're looking for a good even if you just want to think of it as a taut thriller, yeah, it is an suspense movie. Thriller. Yep, um, I liked it better than I like Godfather Two. I know I'm a real minority there. I didn't yes, say one. Yes, you are. But I liked it better than Godfather Two. Um, I was interested. Um, it's just it just don't look for colors. There's no color <laughs> in this. Film. It's very yeah. beige. Oh, uh, I would also but, like to point out I made I was wrong. This film was made only five years before Apocalypse Now. Yeah, I thought that was like just the yeah, end of the 79, 70s. yeah. I'm surprised he didn't go right from this, considering how much it took to make Apocalypse Now, hey. to that. Hmm. But, uh, yeah. But uh, let's go over that, uh, that yeah, poll, that poll question we Tell us. Like. So, um, folks, if you would let us know, we would like to know what movie conspiracy, real or fake, just drives you right up the wall. And you can let us know by emailing us directly at us at maxmikemovies.com. You can head right on over to the website where all of our previous episodes are and where you can also leave comments. That is, of course, maxmikemovies.com. You can find us on social media, which would exist only of Facebook and Twitter because we can't be bothered to do anything. And nobody's mm. told us we should be on Instagram, so I guess we won't bother. And I am and not dancing on TikTok. <laughs> we're not <laughs> that you know of. <clears throat> um and uh, you can find us under the handle of Max Mike Movies. Please give us comments. Come back and say, hey, you know what? You guys were totally wrong about X. Give us ideas for future series, which is done. Yet, come back and say that Mike was totally wrong about X. Oh, Max, that's never going to happen. So why even, uh -huh. why even wish for such a thing, Max? <laughs> it could never happen. Uh -huh. However, the times that Max has been wrong, you can email <laughs> him directly at... <laughs> yep. But... Um, yeah, so we're going to have another uh, yes. conspiracy movie next week, Yes, right? we are. Yep. We're going to watch, yep, Conspiracy Theory. Yeah, yeah. What movie are we going to watch? No, that's the thing. We're going to watch Conspiracy Theory. Yeah, no, Max, I need to know what the movie is because that, I'm going to have... That is the movie. I know we're watching Conspiracy Theory movies, Max. What is the name of the movie? Third Base! <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are actually watching a movie whose title is Conspiracy Theory. Star starring uh, who used to be America's sweetheart, Julia Roberts, and who is, well, let's just say, not exactly Israel's sweetheart, Mel Gibson. Oh, yes. Put the phone down, Mel. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, maybe pull over and try not to, you know, don't talk to the cops. No, he likes Jews now. He said so. Uh, yeah, yeah. So if you like Jews too, tune in next week and watch Conspiracy <laughs> Theory with us. <laughs> This has been a co-production of The Voice of Max and The Movie Wrench. I don't know where that came from at all.